Guys, thanks for being here with us. And guys, if you're watching online, we're so glad that you're with us online. Let me encourage you, while you're there, engage with us online. So there's a chat section. You can just post some comments in there. Say hello to Brookside Church, and we're glad that you guys are with us. Uh, Guys, let me just uh, say, I'm excited to jump into today's message, but there's a couple things, uh, if I could, address before I jump into that. The first thing is this. On February 7th, that's two Sundays from now, we're going to hold our annual business meeting, and it's going to be immediately after the 11 o'clock service. So let me encourage you, if you're a member or if you're not a member, let me encourage you to be a part of this. There, you'll get to hear the budget, the proposed budget for 2021. You'll get to hear some vision. You'll get to meet all the staff. You'll get to meet the elders and so forth. And you'll be able to ask any kind of question you want to ask. And so if you're interested, that is there for you. Now, granted, only members can vote on the proposed budget and any other voting opportunity we might have, but we encourage you to be a part of it as well. Again, that is February 7th, right here at the, after the 11 o'clock service. And uh, let me encourage you to put that on your calendar. Also, let me just say thank you. Um, thank you for your continued support of Brookside Church. We know that at times like this right now, it is hard to release our resources. It's hard to give because we're not sure what the future holds. And we're not sure what COVID is going to continue doing to us. But I just want to say thank you for continuing to support Brookside Church. Your generosity is allowing us to not only continue ministry, but to dream about future ministry. And so let me encourage you, if you want to be a part of a church that is mission-focused, that has every intention of reaching northeast side of Fort Wayne for Jesus, uh, where you can plug in, and when your friends can plug in, this is the place that you can invest in. So the opportunity is there, and let me encourage you to do so, all right? That is what I have to say right now, but now let's jump into the message, all right? If you have not been with us, you would not know that we're in the middle of a sermon series called Disconnected. It's actually more of a question, though, to you. Do you feel disconnected? And I think the obvious answer is yes. Most of us feel disconnected right now. Uh, And that's what COVID did to us. Whenever a crisis shows up, it always creates disconnection. It always creates a, a disconnect, a scattering of us from the things that we're familiar with. And you can cite several things. You could say we've been disconnected from our plans, our routines, our travels, our vacations, from sports. But I would suggest to you that the thing we feel most disconnected from are the people, our relationships, and especially in the church context, most of us feel disconnected from our church family. Some of us haven't seen each other for almost a year now, and we're feeling the absence, Um, and we're feeling that absence. And so the question is, whenever, whenever a crisis hits the church, how does the church respond? The temptation is to just kind of sit down and wait for everything to blow over, and then we can go back to the way things were before the crisis hit. But when you study church history, that never works. Crises never bring what's past back into the future. It always shifts the new normal. And so the question is, What's our response? And the very first week of this message, and if you missed it, you can go online and check it out there, or you can get on your app and you can view it right there on your app. The best thing for a church to do is to become an opportunist. And we decided that an opportunist is one who learns how to pivot and adjust in order to keep the advantage and continue moving forward towards the vision and mission. And so the question is, how do we do that? And so we have discovered, I think, four primary pivots that we need to do at Brookside Church to not wait for it to go back to the way it was, but to step into whatever new normal this crisis is going to bring to us. Now, two weeks ago, the first one we talked about is they pivot from consumerism to connection. You know, prior to COVID hitting, a couple of generations created this mentality of church that says, church is there for me to come and to consume so that I can be spiritually filled up. And so I listen to messages, and I listen to worship music, and I, and I do things to consume things so I can grow myself. But what we learned is that the best thing to do in the church connection or church environment is to build healthy relational connections. Because watch this. If all you do is consume, you get what I call spiritually fat. And then what happens is we can get spiritually lazy. 
But what scripture shows us is the best way to do relationships is to take what you've consumed and give it away to other people. So we're trying to pivot to an emphasis of connection over consuming. Last week, though, we took it another step further. We talked about a pivot from, um, from attraction model to an equipping model. It used to be, the mentality used to be, you know what, church is a place where I need to go and be, be entertained. A place where I need to go and feel comfortable. And so we tried to give that environment to you. We wanted to make sure the coffee was the right temperature, that the environment had the right temperature in here so we're not too cold or too hot, that the seats were comfortable for you. I needed to make sure that the messages were entertaining and interesting and applicable to you. And we want to make sure that the worship is the right volume. We want to make sure that it's the right kind of music that you love to listen to. And here's what we learned in the crisis. That doesn't keep us engaged in the church. In fact, it's not keeping, it's not making people come to Jesus in droves. It was actually having the counter effect. It created that attraction model that didn't really have an impact for the kingdom. So the shift is a shift to equipping. Now, how do you and I become equipped to share the gospel in the world around us? It's a whole nother mentality, and that's one of the shifts. But today, it's a third shift, okay? Here it is. It's the shift from judging to loving. Prior to COVID, there is so much of a fear of walking into a church. You know why? We thought that all of our mess was going to be exposed. All of our problems would be revealed, and we would feel like we didn't fit. And there are so many people who would come through our doors and think, you know what? I don't belong here. And none of us, none of us overtly judged anybody saying, you know what, I don't think you belong with a part of the, with, with us. But that's kind of the sentiment, not just the Brookside, but all over the place of the world. So how can we create an environment of love where people want to step into our environment? Now, here, here's what I have to do, guys. I have to be careful. Because every one of us, if you've been in church for any period of time, we've heard a dozen sermons on loving people, and we've heard another dozen sermons on not judging people. So I don't want to like beat a dead horse, but here's, here's where we have to be careful. If all we do is preach a message of love, the whole world around us is preaching a message of love too. But their understanding of love is different than I think a biblical understanding of love. In the world around us, love is simply this idea of tolerance. It's you do you, man, you be you, and I'll be me. And we'll just like agree to let each other live. Well, I don't know if that's love. That's kindness, that's courtesy, but according to love, love is when you say, you know what? Here's a life preserver. Let me help rescue you. That's love. And we also have to be careful when you talk about judging, because so many times when you hear a message on judgment, we feel accused. It's like, oh man, you guys are not being nice to people, so you should quit judging. I don't want want to have those kind of messages, but one, because you've already heard it. But the reason I want to talk about it today is because I think there's another layer of this concept that we've not hit yet. Now, let me pause and say this. I think there's several different forms of judging. You might disagree with me, but that's okay. As long as you know, at the end of the day, I'm right and you're not, okay? (laughs) Several different forms. Let me talk about a few of these. I think one kind of judging is whenever you form an opinion on an experience. For example, two people uh, visit Paris, France, right? One person says, man, that is the city of love. And another person said, I'm not feeling the love. It's just as dirty and crowded as New York, okay? When you ask, you know, how do you judge Paris? Some says, it was amazing, best place ever. The other person says, I don't think I'll go there again. Somebody says, let's go to the best steakhouse in town. One person says, you know what? That was the best steak I've ever eaten. That is the best steakhouse in town. The other person says, mine was a little bit overdone, a little bit chewy. Not so much the best steakhouse in town, right? So here's the thing, our experience creates a perception, and that perception leads to a judgment call, and that judgment becomes true for us, even if it's not true for you. That's kind of one form of judging. Now, you and I do this all kinds, all the time, like every day. There's another form of judging. This is when the Bible calls us, especially as followers of Jesus, to make judgment calls about what is right and wrong, good and bad, righteous and evil. And so we are asked to use wisdom and discernment and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us to make right judgment calls about everything. 
And as parents, we've got to do this all the time, don't we? We have to encourage our kids to find the right group of friends for that kind of influence. So that's another form of judgment. It's using wisdom to make the right judgment calls. There's, of course, another form of judgment, and that is when an elected official has the authority and the responsibility to mete out judgments based upon the law. This is our judicial system. And we all agree we need this, right? Because if we didn't have it, our whole society would fall into chaos and turmoil. So we need that kind of judgment. But I think there's also a fourth kind of judgment. And that is when it comes from a place of arrogance. A judgment that comes from a place of superiority. A place of blindness. And whenever this kind of judgment is expressed, it's always interpreted in the form of hypocrisy. It's simply where you are guilty, but yet you arrogate to yourself the authority to condemn somebody else who's guilty. Wait a minute, how do you have that authority? You're guilty just as much as I am. It's whenever you look down on someone or somebody else as inferior for whatever reason. Maybe they vote differently than you. Because anybody who votes differently than this, obviously they're not as much of a Christian as I am. See it? Maybe it's the place in town they live because those people over there, they don't belong in my side of the town and I don't belong in their side of the town. See how this works? Maybe it's their economic status. Clearly, I am more affluent than they are, which means I'm probably more important too. Maybe it's the color of their skin. Their ethnicity is simply not as valued as my ethnicity. Or maybe it's their educational background. Clearly, I'm more intellectual than they are. See how this works? That kind of judgment always is interpreted in the form of hypocrisy. Now, here's what's interesting, guys. In the Bible, there is one word for judgment. It's the Greek word krino. But that's the only word for judgment. So it can refer to any of those kinds of judgments. It can refer to opinion you form based upon a perception. It can refer to a judicial system where a judge meets out punishment and rules and so forth. Or it could also refer to the wisdom of discerning between right and wrong. But it could also refer to the hypocritical kind of judgment. So because one word encapsulates all of those forms, what you have to do is look at the context of the Bible to understand which way the author is using it. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Now here's the question, what kind of judgment is he referring to? Is he saying that we shouldn't form opinions based on an experience? Is he saying that I'm not allowed to say that is not the best steakhouse in town? Or is he telling me that I shouldn't use wisdom and discernment to determine between right and wrong and good and bad? I mean, really, what kind of judgment is he referring to? So let's, again, read the context. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, really through 5. Here it is. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, there's the word. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Still not quite sure what kind of judgment he's referring to. I think I can help you. When the Bible uses the word speck in somebody's eye, the best way I can describe that is, well, have you ever been in a workshop that's really dusty and you just kind of get some dust in your eye? Or maybe you've been in a field on a windy day and the wind blows up and all of a sudden you've got some stuff in your eye. Or maybe better yet, it's whenever you have an eyelash that gets stuck in your eye. Do you know what that feels like? Drives you nuts, doesn't it? I mean, it hurts. Makes your eye water. And whenever you do this, check this out. Everyone around you, they see it, don't they? Like, oh, he's got something stuck in his eye. And so what do they do? They're trying to be nice. So they walk up to you and say, hey, let me help you. And so what you, do, you open your eye, like, do you see it? Do you see it in there? Where's it at? 
and they're trying to help you out. But here's, here's where it gets a little bit comical and ridiculous, all right? Jesus says, you know, what if that person who's trying to help you, instead of having a little speck in their eye, they've got a big old two by four coming out of their eye. I mean, it's a ridiculous image, isn't it? So the first implication is there's no way that person could help you. Why? Well, because they can't see themselves. They've got a board coming out of their eye. But it gets worse than this, doesn't it? Because I've got a board coming out of my eye and I try to help you get the speck out of your eye. All of a sudden, I'm starting to beat you down with the board coming out of my eye. I mean, it sounds comical, doesn't it? Ridiculous. But if you think about it, that's the nature of hypocritical judgment. It's when I think, you know what? I'm in a superior position to you, so I have the authority and the know-how to help you. But as I approach you, my hypocrisy doesn't help you. All it does is makes the situation worse. And so I, ending up, I end up hurting you more than helping you. But you know what's really interesting? Go back to verse 3. Look at what it says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. You know what this means, guys? This means that other people see your hypocrisy before you do. It's not because it's unnoticeable. It's because we're not paying attention. Here's the problem. Other people feel the hurt before you see the damage you're doing. And that's a problem. I read a book not too long ago called Leadership and Self-Awareness. It's a powerful book. It's a book you don't want to read because, well, it tells things about yourself that you just don't want to hear. But it's a book you ought to read because what it does, it allows you to develop a sense of the impression you're making on other people. Sometimes we're just simply not aware of our demeanor. We're simply not aware of our personality. We're not aware of our proclivities that have an impact on other people. The problem is we're, we tend to be nice, don't we? So we're not going to approach somebody like, dude, your demeanor is really hurting people. No, almost nobody has the ability or the desire to like walk up to somebody and deal with that kind of confrontation. Almost nobody. If you have that ability and that desire, first of all, you're weird. And secondly, you're very rare. If you have somebody in your life who can do that for you, you're blessed. I'm not kidding. You're blessed. And thankfully, I think I do. But nobody ever wants to do this. And so part of the challenge is recognizing, is there a plank coming out of my eye? Is the way I'm judging people, is it actually having an impact that I can't even see right now? So Jesus says, first, take the plank out of your own eye. And then you'll be able to tell your brother, let me help you take the speck out of your own eye. And that, that's one of the things that we recognize, guys, is other people see our hypocrisy before we do. Now, I could stop right there. And I think all of you would agree with everything I've said so far. Because it's pretty much the same kind of sermon you've heard a dozen times before. There's nothing in here that I think has surprised you. Nothing in here that was earth shattering that you'd be like, oh, I didn't know that. In fact, this has been ingrained to us from day one. So if I stopped right there, you would all agree with me, but I think I would do you no favor at all. It would have been a wasted Sunday. But I think if I could continue... I read the passage again this week and I've seen something I've never seen before. And it took this concept of judgment to a whole nother level. It didn't change what we already believe about judging. What it did do though is added another layer of understanding. Up until now, most of us understand the reason Jesus tells us not to judge people is because of the effect it has on them. Because we're Christians, right? We're supposed to be nice to people. We're not supposed to be offensive. That's true, I think, most of the time, right? So the idea is that we don't judge so that people will not have a bad experience with us. But I read it again, and I realized there's another reason. Go back to verse 1. There are two concerns in verse 1. The first one is don't judge so that we avoid the concern of people being offended by Christians. 
But there's a second concern. Or you will be judged. There it is. Jesus asks us not to judge, watch this, so that we are not judged. And that's where I have a problem. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been taught all of my life to not be concerned about what other people think about me. In fact, we, we tell our kids this all the time, don't we? So like theoretically, if your kid comes home from school and they say, you know what, Jimmy or Johnny or whoever, they told me that I was, I was smelly or, or fat or ugly or, or an idiot, you know, whatever it is, and they come home crying. What do we tell them? We say, listen, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them because they don't get to tell you what's true about you. And so we try to protect ourselves and our kids, don't we, from, a, from the world and making an impression on them that is not accurate. And so I'm looking at this, I'm like, why would Jesus be so concerned about the world's impression of us? Why should we care what the world thinks about us? Now, now let me be clear. Where does our identity as followers of Jesus come from? That comes from Jesus, right? Where does our value come from? That comes from him, doesn't it? Our worth, that comes from him. So, so when the world around me tries to say things to me that devalue me, convince me I'm not worth it, convince me that I have no identity, what I need to remind myself is this. No, no, no. Jesus has already declared those promises over me. So to that extent, no, I'm not listening to the world, but check this out. Jesus defines our identity, but other people determine our influence. There's the difference, guys. There's the difference. And this now makes a ton of sense to me. So should I be concerned about what the world thinks of me? Oh, well, yeah, I should. Because all of a sudden, the way the world thinks of me, that determines how much influence I have over them. Why is this so important, guys? Because what we say as Christians is the gospel, the message of Jesus, it has power in and of itself. I think we even sing songs like this. The gospel can stand on its own two feet. And you know what? It sure can. But guess what? God has chosen to place the gospel on our shoulders. And the way that people view us will determine how much they receive the gospel. Hasn't it been frustrating to you that the gospel is preached more now than it has ever been preached in history? It's been preached in more languages now than it's ever been preached in the past. The ability for the world to understand and experience the gospel is more available now than ever. So here's the question. Why is it that there is an unprecedented number of people not only walking away from the church, but walking away from the gospel? Does this make sense to you? I mean, really, if the gospel can stand on its own two feet, why isn't it standing? I would suggest to you the problem is not with the gospel. I would suggest to you the problem is that the world is judging the church. Why? Because I think the church has judged the world. It's not the kind of judging where we make a wise, discerning judgment of good and bad, right and wrong, but we have looked at the world and said, you are inferior to us because you are sinners. You are inferior to us because you don't have the hope that I have. Maybe we've not said that overtly, but why is it that over the last 50 years, the culture around us has moved the voice of the church from the center of society to the margins of society? And where the church used to have a powerful, strong voice, now we have but a whisper that is so easily dismissible. How did this happen? So here's what I'm learning, guys. The best way for me to communicate the gospel to the point where the world around me receives it, watch this, is not so I can preach louder. It's not so that I can be more clear on what the gospel is. It's so that I can have an influence with the world around me. And again, it all goes back to relationships. 
So here's my question. How are you building influence in your world? Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged in the same way. And when this happens, all of a sudden we've lost our influence. But you know what's interesting, guys? I, I, I found some passages this week that confirm this. Just listen. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, and in favor with God and man. Why is that necessary? I thought we just need to focus on God, right? Like, we live for an audience of one. Isn't that our motto? Which means I don't live for an audience of anyone else. Well, yeah, right, Jesus did. He grew in favor with God and man. Check this out. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Translation, the only way, they're not only going to know there's a Father in heaven, but be compelled to glorify him is when they see your good deeds and are positively influenced towards the gospel. Then they'll say, okay, I'm going to glorify the God that that person loves. Keep reading. Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and what? Enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We have often dissected that passage and said, all right, what was the conditions? What was the formula that God used to say, all right, I'm going to add a ton of people to their number every day? What happened? So we look at that and we're like, you know, oh, they continue meeting together in church. So we should keep doing this. Whether you're online or in person, let's keep meeting together. Oh, and what else did they do? Oh, they broke bread in their homes. They ate together. Okay, so they had community. You ought to get into community life group where you can do these kinds of things. Oh, and what else? They had glad and sincere hearts. They praised God. Man, they worshiped together. They were thankful. They were grateful people in a world that was disappointed and disillusioned. Man, that must have been why God added to their number daily those who were being saved. But you know what we do? We often jump over the next part. They enjoyed the favor of all the people. So let me ask you the question. Do you think Brookside has the favor of this community? I don't, well, let me ask it more specifically. Do your neighbors have your favor? When you consider and evaluate your relationships with your neighbors or perhaps your coworkers or so forth, would you, would you say that you hold a lot of influence with them? Do they enjoy you? Do they appreciate you? Are you respectful? Are you kind? Are you understanding? Are you loving? There's a difference. Here's what I've learned, guys. Judging others destroys your influence, but loving others creates influence. Judging others destroys influence, but loving others creates influence. Guys, this is fascinating to me. Um, there's another passage. This is in John chapter 7. Uh, it's a passage that is preached on all the time. It's a pastor's favorite passage to preach on. That's okay. But I had a conversation with a friend of mine, Derek Paris, this week at lunch, and uh, we were talking about this very passage, and he, he, he said, he gave an insight that neither of us have seen, and we both of us have read this passage dozens of times, right? Probably just like some of you have. And this is something that we just skipped over. I don't know how we did it, but we skipped it over. And, and here's the interesting story. In John chapter 7, there's a woman who the Bible says is caught in the act of adultery. I mean, can you imagine what that would be like, right? Um, she's caught in the act of adultery. And so what happens is this woman, most likely naked, is dragged out into the middle of the street where then she is surrounded by a group of religious people. And she is accused of adultery, which in that day, according to Judaism, is punishable by stoning to death. So each of these religious people, they look around, they each grab a rock. And whenever somebody says go, they're just going to start chucking these rocks until she's dead. That was how severe adultery was in that day. Before they could throw any of their rocks, Jesus steps into the center of the circle, into her 
crisis. And the Bible says she starts, he starts bending down and writing in, in the sand. And nobody knows exactly what he wrote. There's a lot of different theories. But one of the ideas is that he was writing down perhaps some of the sins of those who were accusing her. Another idea is that he's just doodling to distract them from her and put their attention on him. Regardless of what it is, Jesus pauses the death sentence. And then he straightens up. He looks at all the people around there, rocks in hand. And this is what he says. Any of you who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then he just waits. The Bible says that one by one, the oldest first drop the rock and walk away. Until they're all gone and the only people left in the square is Jesus and the woman. He looks at her and he says, woman, is there anyone here who condemns you? Guess what she says? Nobody is here who condemns me, who can condemn me. That's not true. Jesus could condemn her. In fact, of everybody there, Jesus had every right and all authority to pick up a stone and throw it at her. Why? Well, because he's sinless, isn't he? He's the sinless one, and he can do this. But instead, he doesn't judge her. He loves her and sets her free. Guys, that's what Jesus did for us. He had every right and all the authority to condemn us in our sin, but instead he chose to love us. And guess what that did? It built influence with him. And all of a sudden, we have so much favor in him and we accept his message. And I think this is what you and I need to embrace today. There's just one thing I wanna share with you guys and, and that's, that's this last thought. You know, what comes to our relationships, let's think influence, not arrogance. Think influence, not arrogance. For whatever reason, you might think that you're better than somebody else. And I'm not talking about basketball skills, okay? Because there's a lot of people who have more basketball skills than me. I'm talking about in terms of nature, character, worth, value, identity. If we think influence, all of a sudden, the temptation to judge will evaporate. And the appeal to love will grow. Think influence, not arrogance. And I think maybe for some of you, the thing you need to do right now is say yes to Jesus because you now believe he has shown you love when he at all the while could have given you judgment. And because of that, you and I have hope. And so some of you, I think, need to say yes to Jesus today because of what he did to show you love on the cross. If you know all what I'm talking about, Jesus died on the cross. He took all of our sin on him past, present, and future. And he paid the penalty for it so that we wouldn't have to. He so loved us that he died on the cross for me. And instead of judging us, he set us free. And the invitation is for you and me to say yes to that and find our salvation in him. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do that. And so if, if I could invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes, if you're watching online right now, if you wouldn't mind just stop what you're doing Close your eyes and bow your heads and just participate in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will be with us now as we consider our heart, as we consider our eternal destiny, and as we embrace the belief that you loved us when all the while you could have judged us. But instead, in your love, you went to the cross you paid the penalty and you set us free. So my prayer, Jesus, is for anyone in the room or anyone watching online that they've never embraced you as Lord and Savior, that they will do so right now because of the hope and the freedom that you are giving us today. So help us to say yes, to take the invitation and change our eternal destiny from hell to heaven, from death to life, from hopelessness to hope. Thank you, Jesus, for your influence, for how you elevated us and made us alive in you.
We pray all of this in Jesus' name.